The constitutions of many states have specific language promising that every child will have an equal opportunity to receive a good education. The reality in many states is that children in the inner cities do not get the quality education available in the suburbs, which has led to a desegregation lawsuit in Hartford, Connecticut. This case, known as Chef v. O'Neill, would have a major impact on the rights of students to a quality education, as well as the responsibility of the state to provide this education. On May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal and thus unconstitutional. This ruling is generally thought of as the end of school segregation, as it forced many southern schools to integrate. Unfortunately, in the years to come, many smaller Supreme Court cases would weaken Brown v. Board of Education. One of the most important cases was Milliken v. Bradley out of the Detroit School District. Milliken was a major roadblock for Brown because the Supreme Court ruled that cities could not include their suburbs in their desegregation plans. This left Hartford as a segregated school district where only 10% of its students were white, while the suburbs remained predominantly white. John Britton was a Yukon law professor who had been looking to fight the segregation brought on by district lines for a while. He finally saw his chance in 1988. The trigger that really led us to bring the suit was a report issued by the then Commissioner of Education in the state of Connecticut named Gerald Tarazi. And this Tarazi report came out around December of 1988, and it found that Connecticut maintained two school systems, a one poor and urban and segregated and performing below the state's educational standards. And the other was suburban and predominantly white and much more economically affluent and performing or exceeding the state standards. And this was the trigger that kind of broke the camel's back. Referenced in this report were the statewide mastery tests, which showed huge disparities between segregated urban students and their suburban counterparts. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Uh, Hartford students came out much worse than all the suburbs. <laughs> uh, in fact, most of the cities were in the same boat around uh, Connecticut. Mr. Britton joined forces with other civil rights lawyers who wanted to help fix the problem. The, the original le legal team was, uh, was quite large um, and inclusive. Um, and uh, one of the reasons for that is the, you know, this was an important national case. It was really the first time that state constitutional claim was going to be used to address both resource inequities and um, school integration in the same complaint. So it was a very significant kind of a landmark case. The team began holding a series of community meetings in order to look for potential plaintiffs. It was at one of these late night community meetings that the lawyers found their lead plaintiff, a young woman named Elizabeth Horton Sheff and her third grade son Milo. In 1989, the lawyers finally filed their complaint against Governor William A. O'Neill and other educational officials from around the state. The legal basis was under the Connecticut Constitution that the right to an adequate education coupled with the provision of equal educational opportunity uh, under the different provisions of the Connecticut Constitution formed the basis for our legal theory. Three and a half years after the original claim was filed, finally, in the winter of 1992, the case Chef v. O'Neill appeared before Judge Harry Hammer in a West Hartford courtroom. Both sides brought forward many witnesses to testify on the effects of an integrated education. The main points of a dispute in the first trial was largely the ultimate question of whether the state was responsible for the segregation. We don't think the Constitution has been breached in any way by the state because the state hasn't contributed to or caused the problems that are at the basis of the lawsuit. In 1995, after many delays, the plaintiffs were disappointed when Judge Harry Hammer ruled with the defendant. In his 72-page decision, Judge Harry Hammer wrote that unless it could be proven that the state's actions led to the segregation, he did not have the power to order any change. I, I was angry about it. 
I thought it was I thought it was wrong. I thought what he did was absolutely absolutely wrong, and I thought we presented an outstanding case, and I, I was very very disappointed at what occurred. There was immediate outlash over the decision, with many students marching downtown to protest it. The lawyer saw this as a sign to continue, and they soon filed an appeal with the Connecticut Supreme Court. The first thing we said was that the court had to decide the issue, mm -hmm. unlike the trial judge who said, I'm not deciding the issue, it's not appropriate for me to decide. So that was the first thing, first hurdle we had to get over, that they ought to decide the case. That, in my opinion, was an easy hurdle, but we had to go there. And then uh, we had to show that, uh, as a factual matter, it was clear that an equal educational opportunity required an integrated education. Later that year, Mr. Horton would argue these points in front of the Connecticut Supreme Court. And here we are, the state saying, uh, you people shouldn't even adjudicate a case in the one area where there's an affirmative constitutional responsibility. The only area in the Constitution where there's an affirmative uh, responsibility of the state. Uh... In 1996, seven years after the original claim was filed, the Connecticut Supreme Court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs in a 4-3 to three decision. Chief Justice Ellen Peters cited the district lines which were used for school placement as a key factor in the decision. As a result of this decision, the state was required to implement a variety of school integration options in order to increase the number of students attending an integrated school. Some of the more popular methods include open choice, which allows urban students to attend suburban schools instead of their neighborhood schools, or magnet schools, which accept kids from around the area. Although these options have faced issues along the way, they have helped to close the achievement gap for Hartford students. Approximately 40% of Hartford students attend an integrated school. These students achieve noticeably better than their peers who attend segregated schools. It's thanks to Chef versus O'Neill that these students were able to receive this opportunity. The settlement with the state of Connecticut and with the plaintiffs in the Chef versus O'Neill case, though not as perfect as some may want, and nevertheless has advanced the needle towards integration and diversity more than any other policy in the state. If you step outside of Connecticut, then you will see that what we're doing here is held as a model um, around the nation. Magnet Schools of America is having this conference here to showcase what we're doing here. The chef case gave students in Hartford uh, the right to an equal educational opportunity under the Connecticut Constitution, and it placed that burden squarely on the state of Connecticut. So this case has a lot of positive impact on the rights of students throughout the state, not just minority students, but also non-minority students. There's nothing worse for non-minority students to be going to a town where all the students they're with all the time are non-minority themselves. That's not life. <laughs> uh, so this is a two-way street. Obviously for the students in Hartford this has been a big improvement. Um, so it created a responsibility for the state to do something um, about the segregation and it created responsibilities um, for local communities and their schools to either open up their communities, have magnet schools, or accept students through an interdistrict transfer program called Open Choice. After Brown hit various roadblocks, Sheffers O'Neill ensured Connecticut students received their right to a quality, integrated education, placing the responsibility to ensure this education on the state. We shall overcome someday. Darling.